Welcome back. It's the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier. Joined as always, my co-host Nick Filato. Today we get to break down a win. The Giants, all 22 coaches film on the offensive side of the ball. We're doing both tonight. We're doing the offense. We're doing the defense. A lot of fun film to break down. So we wanted to get it out fast. Schedules cooperated. Today's the off or the first podcast here is the offense, Nick. And I'm excited to talk about this as equally as I am almost the defense. Because, yes, there were some mistakes, especially in the second half, bog downs, but the offense looked pretty good in the first half, um, and there were some really fun plays to break down. I felt like what you said off pod was really true, and we'll get into more of that, but they had good counters, the Giants, for what the Washington Commanders were running on defense, and I don't feel like that was the case against Del Rio, really, at all last year twice. They played Del Rio twice last year, and they just couldn't counter what he wanted to do from a schematic standpoint. Kafka was in his bag. Maybe it was the help of Dable getting involved, according to Pat Leonard, at least, who who knows that's true or not, but he said Dable got more involved in offensive meetings. Not sure if it was the case, Nick, but certainly looked like the offense from a schematic standpoint, from a game planning standpoint, from a specific individual play call standpoint against what they were doing defensively on specific calls were there. They were sound and they were making the right decision. So I want to hear a little bit about that from you. I want to hear a little bit about what your thoughts were. And maybe, you know, as we start this off, as you typically do and we typically do, maybe one thought that changed from watching the tape versus watching the broadcast angle. Not necessarily one thought that changed, Dan, but I do want to talk overall about the scheme and how the Giants were able to exploit Washington. Look, football's a game of chess. Mike Kafka, he rolled out 12 personnel often. Now, when the offense rolls out a certain personnel package, the defense has the opportunity to match it with whatever personnel they want to match it with. Having Saquon Barkley back, 12 personnel prompted Jack Del Rio early to match 12 personnel with base. And what do we talk about all offseason? how excited we were about this 12 personnel package because Darren Waller is a quasi wide receiver, even though he's low key, a good blocker at tight end, which we didn't necessarily expect. Maybe not good, but he's better than damn underrated. Yeah. Underrated. And then Daniel Bellinger, he doesn't get the accolades, but damn Daniel Bellinger is really important to this offense. Well, the giants rolled out 12 personnel. They matched with base Washington. And then what did the giants do? They, just kept passing out of 12 personnel and not just little quick passes, not these concerns. No, they were throwing deep. They were throwing bombs. Like think about even the quick little pass that they had to Wandale Robinson. Why did Wandale Robinson have so much success on that play, making these Washington defenders look like they had never tackled a football player before It's because it was against base personnel. They motioned Darren Waller to the other side of the field. And then that just shifted the linebackers giving Wondell Robinson more opportunity to get outside leverage against a linebacker who was on the hash. Tyrod Taylor confirmed it, gave it to Wondell, and then he just made like three or four guys miss because a bunch of fat linebackers were out there on Wondell Robinson and not a slot cornerback. So it was just the Giants running out there and using 12 personnel against base and exploiting them vertically and also just with speed over the middle of the field. And then it was also just the zone coverage of Jack Del Rio. He ran a lot of zone early in this game. Tyrod Taylor picked the zone coverage apart. They were great concepts that high load people. Mm -hmm. You know, whenever Jack Del Rio and the defense rotated a safety down into the box, confirmed one-on-one matchups on the outside for Tyrod. Tyrod Taylor would take those deep shots to Jalen Hyatt. So the Giants had answers in this game. They had a lot of answers for what Washington was attempting to do. In the second half, we saw some adjustments though, Dan. Saw a lot more man coverage. Giants ended up having answers for that, but the execution wasn't there. But overall, I was very pleased with what the Giants were able to accomplish in this game, despite the fact that it was only 14 points. Yeah, I think you did a great job breaking that down. And I keep here, keep, People keep referencing the 14 points. It's such a lame reference. I mean, look, they had three points off a 42-yard missed field goal that never misses. And they had a fumble on the nine-yard line or the seven-yard line from Saquon Barkley and the opponent seven-yard line. That's a minimum of another three, maybe seven points. Yeah, man, they're starting Tyree Phillips. They just claimed this guy off of someone's practice squad. They're just Justin Pew at the left tackle. Like, we got to take everything into context. Yeah. So the offensive line has been the big problem with this team the entire season. Offensive line wasn't great in this game, but it was functional. And that's all I'm asking for right now, which is give whoever the hell the quarterback is a functional offensive line. 
Yeah, it's functional. And, and you know, if, if it ever reaches its peak, it's going to get even better because they had a big play dialed up to Jalen Hyatt that Taylor would have hit Hyatt for. It might have been even like a 75-yard touch on Hyatt. It's so much mm. steps there. There was a safety who might have broken over. It would have been a tough foot race there between Hyatt and the safety. But Tyree Phillips blew the block, and it was a sack. And similar play happened earlier with Chase Young against Justin Pugh, though. I don't blame Pugh as much for that one after I watched it on tape, Nick, because I think Young just timed the snap count really well and got a really good jump. I think you know the play I'm referring to. But even so, it's these two sacks that really bogged down drives and took more points off the board but outside of those plays and taylor missing the third and three to wandale robinson where he threw too hot and it hit off uh robinson's hands but it was too hot of a throw wasn't really many misses by the offense there was some conservative stuff that led to punts but not really that many mistakes um so i just felt like the offense looked a lot better in this game sure the, the matchup was great too so we should we should uh confirm that but the coaching really stood out in this game and tyrod taylor's play as well which we'll get to later as well as some other individual you know skill players that really big games in this one Dude, too nick so two, two or four of the giants sacks suffered were i mean one was a miscommunication mckethan was a little bit late yep. peeling off that was in the second quarter with seven ten left on a first and ten mckethan was supposed to peel back to account for chase young we've seen the giants run this a lot of teams run that peel back block and he was just a little bit late doing so stepped down probably shouldn't have done that and then the other sack was at the end of the first quarter it was a botched rpo it was supposed right. to be uh, an RPO in the red zone to Sterling Shepard. So it also goes to show you that they're trying to get Shep fed a little bit. He's in the red zone. He had the look, but Sterling Shepard just fell down. And that's not Sterling Shepard's fault. That happens sometimes. Tyrod Taylor read what the defense did. It was the right, correct read, I believe. Well, I think, I'm not sure if I have the play, but it was the right read. And Shepard just ended up falling down. So what is Tyrod going to do? He's going to eat the sack in that situation because yes. you have no other options. Yep. All right, let's get into, there's a lot to talk about within this offensive breakdown, but let's first get into the play breakdowns. People will like want us to get to that quickly, Nick. So we'll start there, and then after that, we'll work into overall evals of players like Tyrod Taylor, Darren Waller, the offensive line, things of that nature. Before, Nick, we get into the play breakdowns, and we are going to get to the films. We have cut-ups of a lot of plays. Nick has a bunch, and then I have some I want to throw in at the end as well. We'll talk about a few things, some stats that really stood out to me that are interesting. So first, I want to shout out to Duo, ba Duo Barrow, who is also a film analyst on Twitter who I follow. I'm not sure if you're connected with him, Nick, but he does a pretty damn good job. And he did the numbers and he, he actually totaled the stats on the Giants quarterbacks under pressure this season. So Tyrod Taylor under pressure this season, he suffered eight sacks on a hundred dropbacks and 8% sack rate. He's been pressured on 18.6 uh, or his pressure to sack rate is 18.6%. That's 17th highest in the NFL. Daniel Jones had 28 sacks on 197 dropbacks, 14.2% sack rate, 30.8% pressure to sack rate, third highest in the NFL. So I just thought that was really, those were really interesting numbers there. Um, and they, they did it with the snaps together for Saquon Barkley as well. Uh, these are the snaps where they had Saquon Barkley on the field, I believe. So yeah, yeah these are only the snaps with Saquon Barkley on the field because this was to account for uh, the idea that with Saquon Barkley on the field, um, you know, it changes, it changes everything. So just an interesting stat right there. I wanted to see if you had any thoughts on that. Not too many takeaways, but if we want to get into Tyrod a little bit, just because this stat makes Tyrod look good. Look, just going off of the film, we're going to get into some pro football focus stats on Tyrod Taylor. People don't maybe love pro football focus stats, which is fine. I can understand why people don't love it, but just going off the eye test, man, Tyrod Taylor processes and collects information a lot faster than Daniel Jones in the drop back phase of a play. I think that's just objective at this point because Tyrod Taylor, man, he has multiple answers by the time he hits his back foot. If his priors, what he thought the coverage was going to be is not confirmed once he gets there because of all the processing that happens on a three-step drop. And that's one of the areas that Daniel Jones struggles, not trying to make this a huge quarterback controversy, but I think we have to be objective here. When it comes to collecting information on what the defense is doing right now, the way Tyrod is playing and the way Daniel played over the last two or three games that we've seen him, Tyrod gets that information into his hardware, processes it, and has the answers based on what that defense is doing. And that is invaluable when you don't have an offensive line that is that great at protecting. So right now, Tyrod Taylor, I, I just got to applaud him because he is uh, he's doing an excellent job running this offense. and masking maybe what is a suboptimal offensive line situation because of what he is seeing pre to post snap and what he's confirming post snap. Yeah. I think you nailed it there, Nick. And I think, look, 
these are numbers that are tallied and put together by someone. They're not narrative based numbers. They're just objective numbers. The reason why Daniel Jones is the third highest sack rate and Tyrod has the 17th highest with very similar offensive line. Let's not look at Justin Pugh as some unbelievable left tackle. Let's not like there's been major issues across the board really with Saquon Bark on the field is because of what you just said. Tyrod Taylor processes information faster. He also moves through his reads faster. I have a couple examples that I can show you, but like there's so many examples of him on play side, quick game, like spacing concepts where there were two in this game where he comes to the play side and comes off of it so fast. And that's been an issue for Jones's entire career, how slow or fast he can come off the play side or come back through his progressions multiple times. Uh, Taylor worked through the full progression from the play side back to the middle, then to the back side. This was on the Saquon Barkley check down. He also on one play on the scramble on third and two that I put up. These are both on Twitter. I'll find the clips later potentially because I don't want to slow down this podcast. But on the third and two play, he looked to the play side, wasn't there. It was quick game spacing. Looked back to the back side, wasn't there. Looked back to the play side, still wasn't there. And then decided to scramble for three yard gain for the conversion. It's all just happening so, so fast compared to Daniel Jones. It's not a subjective thing anymore. It's an objective thing to say. Anyone who watches the tape can see it. Jones is a very slow processor compared to Tyrod. Now, I don't know how he is compared to like Howell's a slow processor. We just watch the slow processor, for example. There are other quarterbacks who process slower than others, but you know, Jones, it's very clunky in the pocket also with Jones. It feels like with Tyrod, it's a, it's not, not many wasted steps. He he really moves through things fast. He, like you said, he processes it before the ball's even at his hands. That's the cool part. It's like so much information is moving through his, his head at that point. That it's before he, can, he completes the drop back. Yeah. So it's yeah, a three-step it really drop. He catches the football. He's realizing what the safeties are doing. He hits that back foot. If his preconceived first read based on the coverage that he thought it was going to be is different, he already has the answer to what the coverage is post snap. And that is a huge element to playing quarterback because right. you are going to be able to win that chess match within a play against a defense because you're going to have the answers because you know how to confidently read defenses and you've seen so many defenses throughout your career that you're not easily fooled. And I'm not saying and Daniel it, Jones is easily fooled, but Daniel Jones, this is an area of the game that we saw, saw last year. How many times last year, Dan, did we see Daniel Jones catch the football in shotgun? Look, first read's not there. Shit, let me just go through the B gap. Three yard game, four yard game, sometimes more, which is excellent, but he didn't stand in the pocket and just do full progression, progression reads and then find who is open and who is going to be available based on what that defense is doing, or at least not consistent enough. There's probably, there are uh, examples right. of him doing it. Cause people will just point to examples be like, you got, cause we had breakdowns too. There's of course. examples of it. The problem is there's like a few examples of it for Jones on a full season. And then Tyrod has three to five per game when you're watching him. That's what we need from Jones, three to five per game of these, not, you know, four to five examples over the course of a season. And I just, I, it, it's, you really see it when you watch these games on tape. Like we just watched two Taylor games. We've watched a lot of Jones games in a row. It's clunky is the word I use. It's very clunky with Daniel Jones back there. It's much quicker. It's much faster with Tyrod Taylor. And that's just some part of Jones's game that he has to improve. Like we saw examples of him improving from a pocket manipulation standpoint, Nick last year, but it just doesn't look like this level that Tyrod's at. And this is not even the highest level of it, but it, it is actually a pretty high level. Like Tyrod's underrated by a lot of people's standards. Like he's probably like you talk, we talked about this for the pod. We think he might be one of the best, if not like he's top three backup quarterback in the NFL right now. And he might not be three. Like that's how it, like we mentioned names like Gardner Minshew. I watched Taylor. Taylor's a better quarterback than Gardner Minshew. Gardner Minshew makes tons of mistakes that lead to turnovers. Taylor had no mistakes in the last two games, really. He had a missed throw to Wando Robinson on third and three this game. And that was basically it the entire game. It almost felt like it's just a good level quarterback. But look, when you see numbers like that, and that's why I wanted to bring them up where they're getting pressured on a very similar rate, but one's taking a lot more sacks than the other. It says something, in my opinion, and it looks that way on the tape, too. Go ahead. So two of the biggest issues with this offense, even last year, one, offensive line. We saw that this season. Yeah. I think Tyrod Taylor helps to mask that better than what Daniel Jones did when he was in there, albeit I can concede that Daniel Jones maybe was in a worse situation against better defenses. But the other huge issue with this offense, despite the fact that they won a playoff game, was they were dead last in explosive plays. I say this so often. Tyrod Taylor is creating explosive plays. He is pushing the football down the field, which is maximizing Darren Waller. It's maximizing Jalen Hyatt. And Tyrod is 
doing this not just because it's a play where it's like, this is what was called in the huddle. I'm going to, he reads everything. He saw that safety roll down on the first Jalen Hyatt play, caught the football on the drop back portion, just held the post safety was flowing over the top in the middle of the field. and just going to hold you there, hold you there, hold you there. All right. That's enough time. Deliver the football to Jalen Hyatt. We've seen Daniel Jones do things like that as well, but now Tyrod is doing it more frequently. That's going to open up this offense. It's going to open up the rushing attack. It's going to open up the quiz, quick passing attack. You have to threaten every inch of the field. It's something we've talked about so much on this podcast. Tyrod's doing that right now. Yeah, he is. And, you know, people don't, uh, you know, you mentioned the Giants in 2022 were dead last in explosive plays. They were dead last in explosive pass plays, too. They The only reason they were even remotely functional from an explosive play standpoint is because they had a lot of explosive run plays between Jones and Barkley. But from a pass play standpoint, they didn't have many. And I know people don't like the PFF big time throw metric because it is subjective. And I agree with that. But we can at least consider that it's worth something and at least shows like because look, the Giants had 25 different throws of 20 plus yards to five different receivers this game with Tyrod Taylor. They there's only been like six teams that have done that all season long this year. And the Giants weren't one of them and the Giants weren't one of them last year. And Oh, this is a jarring number to me, Nick. Since 2022, when Brian Dable took over, Jones is at 623 pass attempts. According to Pro Football Focus, he's at 10 big-time throws. Now, agreed, maybe these big-time throws are subjective to, his, to an extent, but they're obviously taking into account the distance, the air yards, how far downfield there were, and explosive plays, like you said, which we were getting this game. We had six explosive pass plays in this game with Tyrod Taylor. We haven't had that many overall this season. I don't know before that how many we've had. We had a lot in Cardinals game. So Jones on 623 attempts is at 10 of those. Tyrod Taylor on 88 attempts is at six. I mean, it's not, again, this is not the be all end all metric. It's PFF, but it's worth something. And it shows, and it shows up on the tape. It's just like this act thing we were just talking about with quick game. Tyrod's moving through things so fast. And with the explosive pass plays, Tyrod is throwing the football downfield on a third and two, right? It's, third, it's second and nine, and Tyrod's eyes are not going directly to what my solution is at the sticks. That's, I think, what it may be one of the biggest problems with Jones. And yes, this could partially be because he played with Jason Garrett so long. I don't know. I don't care anymore what the reason is. All I know is if the Giants want to get better on, with Daniel Jones as their quarterback, he has to be able to do this. It, it can't be because this happened, he can't do it. It has to be he's doing it or he's not. And if he's not, they're not winning games and they have no ceiling. If he's doing it, okay, yes, he's 26 years old and he can grow and we can get better under him. But on some of these plays, man, a third and two where Tyrod Taylor throws to Jalen Hyatt, I just know Daniel Jones is never throwing that ball. He's looking for the solution on third and two, which is fine. And it was a screen to the other side that wasn't really there. But like, and maybe if he doesn't see that, he's running with it. And that's fine. Maybe he picks it up. But how many times can you move the chains without actually scoring touchdowns still until as a fan base, you say, let's take the shots downfield, because even if we miss that, the chance of us making it like the six times Tyrod did in this game or whatever it was for 20 plus yards, those are well worth the times we miss it. We only need to hit one of two versus the grinding first downs, eyes to the sticks at all times that doesn't really get us touchdowns and doesn't really give us a ceiling. And that's what I want people to think about the ceiling of going for those throws on second and nine, like Tyrod did on the 43 yarder to Hyatt or the end zone one on third and two that he missed. But if he catches it, it's a touchdown. And the impact of just taking that shot and how the defense is going to respect right. you. Don't take PFF's big throw metric at its face. Don't listen to Dan and I listen to the Seattle Seahawks defense and the 49ers defense and what all of these defensive teams have said about the New York Giants when Daniel Jones was unfortunately back there when he was playing those teams. Again, maybe he can do it. We saw we didn't see enough of it in 2022. We saw it in 2019 when he was a rookie. Yeah. OK, and you can read into that if, how you want to. But defenses are on to how this offense operated when Daniel Jones was playing the way he was playing this season. With Tyrod, it is different. And the defenses are going to have to respect the deep ball whenever Tyrod Taylor has a one-on-one -on -one matchup because he has no problem throwing it, dude. And we don't want to be Jones bashers on this. We're trying not to be. We're trying as hard as we can to be objective. So we consider that Jones can be able to evolve in this offense and start to make those throws downfield as he gets more confidence in the O-line. You know, he gets more confidence in himself. He plays a little bit differently, but he has to start doing it. That's what it is. It's not a matter of if he can, can he, da 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 da, da. Just do it, right? Like, that's it. When he comes back into the game, and he is going to be the starter, Dable's already confirmed this, he has to start taking these shots and stop worrying so much about the sticks. Where's my first down? Where's my solution? Where's my first down? He has to do that on the plays you talked about, Nick, where the safeties rotate down. Because guess what? Jones was facing similar looks. That's the thing me and Nick have discussed a lot this season, and we showed you guys on the film. You can see it for yourself. 
Jones has had opportunities in these spots, but he was looking for the sticks a lot. And that's fine. You want the first down solution, right? Like that's smart QBing. But guess what? When defenses are now attuned to it, like Nick just said, it's no longer smart QBing to look for the sticks when defenses are playing the sticks. That's when you have to start doing what Tyrod's doing here, which is he sees a safety rotate down. I know I have a one-on-one. I'm going to give him that shot. That's what he said after the game in the postgame, Tyrod. He said, I told Jalen, if you get one-on-ones, I'm giving you those shots. And he gave one earlier in the game, too, that he missed on. And it wasn't even a full one-on-one because the safety came over. Remember, at the end of that play, the safety got there. But it didn't matter because... He saw it. He gave him that opportunity. And then later in the game, he connected on two of them with Jalen Hyatt, the 33 yarder and the 42 yarder, whatever it was, 44. And so that's all we're talking about here. I wanted to bring up those two stats. I think they're interesting to show the dichotomy in quarterback play. And Jones, when he gets back in, is going to have to really produce at that level. It can't just be. We talked about this last night, but now that Tyrod's shown the capability, that's the level Jones is going to have to play to. He's going to have to get better at shooting those shots. And two, on quick game, he's going to have to move through that progression faster on quick game because Tyrod moves through it very, very fast. And I'll never tell anybody how to fan. And that's Mm -hmm. a big talking point on the New York Giants. But everybody should hope that Daniel Jones harnesses that and plays that well. Right. Plays as well as Tyrod Taylor has played. So we're all hoping for that. The Giants are tied to Daniel Jones right now. They gave him $40 million a year. That contract, what, could be three years. I know it was a four-year deal. They could get out of it after two, whatever. But we want Daniel Jones to take these steps, okay? So it's not a Daniel Jones hater type of thing, but you want to get in the plays and show some of these instances that we were just referring to? Yes, but one more final thing on that. You may look at us and say, or look at that analysis Nick just gave and say, well, Tyrod didn't score that many points, but I just got to tell you, the film doesn't, the film tells a different story. It simply does. We're going to have to hopefully show you guys that and explain that to you guys, but the film tells a different story. The Giants could have had more points. It's not Tyrod's fault. Gano misses a 42 yarder. It's not Tyrod's fault. Barkley fumbles inside the nine. And it's not Tyrod's fault that he doesn't score that many. Like it was his fault. He didn't score before halftime, but it's not Tyrod's fault that Darren Waller gets held and they don't call it on a play that he throws a ball to a spot where Waller didn't get held. And he was allowed to fully run to the back of the pine line. He catches that football. We just saw it this game. And those are all examples of two games. Tyrod got to play with really bad O lines. Like, yes, the O lines played better, but it's still not a good O line. Like I, I saw this stat earlier and I told this to Nick, the giants are dead last in offensive line continuity this year. They've only had 14% of their snaps with the same offensive line this season, 32 out of 32 teams. So, and that's, it's changed in the both games with Tyrod too. They've had injuries in game in the Buffalo game against, again, a defense that led the league in sacks going into that game. It's not like Tyrod's facing some bottom tier D and I know Washington hasn't been as good, but they had good pass rushers in this game that at times made Pew and Tyree Phillips not look good in this game at times. So just things to consider. Um, it's not always about the points. Sometimes it's about what the film shows from, the, from a lot of standpoints. Dude, six of the seven games, the Giants had a different starting combination on the offense. Crazy. Line. It's just, it's absolutely silly. But yeah, we'll, we'll get into some of these. What's going on, Big Blue Banter listeners? I'm excited for the football season for several reasons. And one of those reasons is Prize Picks, which is North America's largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform. And it's so simple to use. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including professionals, sharks, and people who are going to exploit you, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections, and you just watch the winnings roll in. It's very simple to play and gives you a little extra skin. I've set my picks in less than 60 seconds. There are so many stats to choose from, and the withdrawals of funds are easy and quick. Dan and I will be adding a segment to our show before every game where we pick our favorite stats, more or less, yards or touchdowns, what have you, and we'll be discussing why from a scheme, matchup, and game theory perspective. I love their promotions and how easy their interface is to operate at prize picks. I may select more on tackles for a loss from Bobby Okereke or Kayvon Thibodeau next game. They also do other sports as well. It's a really cool experience. Please join Dan and I in the fun of prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. You will not regret it. Make Little Caesars, the official pizza sponsor of the NFL, part of your game day. There are few things better in the world than kicking back, watching some football, and biting into some delicious Little Caesars pizza. 
order online during our pizza pizza pregame one hour before and three hours after NFL kickoffs plus all day on Sunday and get ready for some football and fun. Choose your favorite Little Caesars pizza or pick the toppings you crave. Old world pepperoni, pepperoni, extra cheese, Italian sausage, olives, onions, pineapple if you're into that. Put it on half the pie, the entire pie. There are so many other options that I don't have time to name. Slap that on a round crust, a thin crust, a stuffed crust, a Detroit style deep dish. Either way, you win. And speaking of winning, Everyone scores with convenient delivery or our in-store pizza portal pickup. So grab some friends and enjoy a few. So we'll start right here from the New York Giants. This is just 11 personnel shotgun. This is a second and nine plays, a second play of the game. And this is one of the uh, plays we were talking about just basically all season. Look at the top of the screen. This is how Jack Del Rio plays the New York Giants when Daniel Jones was back there. At the top of the screen, you're going to see a cover two defense from the Washington Commanders. Tyrod Taylor wants this stick. He wants to throw the number two receiver, Wandale Robinson, who's running open. Watch that cornerback just sink. Now, Tyrod just quickly came off of it. He didn't even opt to throw this ball, which is something that maybe we would like to see. Confirm that that player is coming down and throw that football. You could see the safety aggressively flowing over the top of the numbers at the top of the screen. But instead, Tyrod Taylor comes off it real quick, looks to the front side of the play, and then rips the football, but it goes out of bounds. But I wanted to just kind of highlight that early on in this game, they were running that same cut type technique, whatever the hell you want to call it. Just the number, the uh, outside cornerback is reading the release of the number two player. With that safety aggressively flowing over the top to the field side, Giants don't end up pulling the trigger on this, and ends up being a dead play. Jack Del Rio goes right back into his bag. Cover two, yeah. just going to spy on those number two, give you those throws to the field side. It's just unfortunately the Giants end up taking a lot of those throws later on in the game, especially attacking the boundary from three by one sets, which was something the Giants were able to do successfully. So the good news on this play, I thought, was now I also thought that Tyrod Taylor potentially missed a shot to Darren Waller there over the middle of the field once he reset. But there was good signs on this play, and I put this on Twitter. Second play of the game. It felt like we might get a competent game, Nick, when you see one, the right side of the offensive line pick up a stunt for the feels like the first time in forever there. As you roll that back, great job there by both Tyree Phillips and Glowinski to pass off and pick up this stunt. And a great job by Tyra Taylor to reset the pocket. Watch how he slides to find a new landing spot there and then resets the pocket. This is what you want to see from the quarterback at all times. Don't escape right there. Reset and find a new throwing lane. Now, I wish he would have thrown to Darren Waller there over the middle of the field. But he didn't see that. It didn't work through there. It, you know, he, he didn't he didn't recognize that that's on Taylor. But I do think it was good signs early on to see a blitz pick up like that and then a nice slide and reset from the quarterback. Yeah, no, this is one, though, that you can point at Tyrod Taylor and find some fault. Like you didn't throw yes. to the field side after you saw that cornerback squatting. You didn't throw to Darren Waller. So you could sit here and bash Tyrod if you want to, if sure. you're so inclined. And now, Dan, we have the first play to Jalen Hyatt. Love this throw by Tyrod Taylor. Love this play overall. It's third and six, 1032 left in the first quarter. You have a three by one set. Look pre-snap. Looks like this could be quarter, quarter, half, maybe. Looks like maybe it's too high, but it's not necessarily that. This is going to be a cover three with a lockdown on the number one wide receiver, Jalen Hyatt. So it looks like everyone's running a zone coverage up at the top of the screen. And you're going to have that post safety flow over the top. He's originally over the number two receiver in the three by one set. He flows over the top. The apex defender ends up moving out towards Wandell Robinson. And now you're going to have that boundary side safety rotate down into the box. Look at Saquon Barkley while also seeing if there's any routes coming over the middle of the field. You have the linebacker who was sugaring the A gap, who's going to robot, roll over and go back underneath Darren Waller. Look how much attention's on Darren Waller. But what does that do? That confirms the one on one matchup for Jalen Hyatt. And Tyrod Taylor does such a phenomenal job holding the safety in place. You see the safety rotating towards the middle of the field. Tyrod Taylor catches it. Once he hits that back foot, he flips his hips, gets his feet oriented, gets his shoulders to his target. And it's not even like Jalen Hyatt purely has this, this cornerback beat. He has a little bit right. of an edge, right? But this throw, he allows Jalen Hyatt to run underneath it. Like this is, this is Tyrod Taylor throwing a pass and just trusting that his wide receiver has the speed and acceleration to locate it. And that's just well-placed right outside of the reach of Benjamin St. Juice and it allowed Jalen Hyatt to make this catch. And let's watch Tyrod Taylor's helmet. Hold the safety, hold the safety, hold the safety, hit the back foot, get everything oriented, 
Safety's nowhere close, and that football's right in the bread basket for Jalen Hyatt. Yeah, outside shoulder where you want it, led ahead of the receiver, so it drops right in there. And I just love what you said, watching his helmet and then watching his feet, man, his lower half. Skyrod oh, yeah. is such a connected quarterback. I think that's what's let him stay in the NFL so long. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I think it's, I, I, I was thinking about that today, watching him. I think it's really what's allowed him to stay in the NFL, NFL so long. You watch, just, just focus here if you're watching on YouTube, on his lower half here as he transitions from, looking left with the stripe of his helmet to flipping and rip flipping back to his right. And then getting rid of that football. Everything is so connected. Everything is working in conjunction with itself with, with it. Uh, with, and I type like, Nick, like staying connected is something I'm trying to do in my golf swing. This guy's doing it as a quarterback, <laughs> throwing a football 40 yards down the field on the outside shoulder, leading the receiver, just an excellent, phenomenal throw here and a nice pocket. Double well. bogey. Uh, yeah. Thanks in large part to, or not in large part, but in part to Saquon Barkley with a nice blitz pickup as well. Oh, it's a huge blitz pickup by Saquon Barkley. Saquon Barkley has the last two seasons been pretty damn good in this department. I don't think he gets probably the due credit that he deserves. It's against a linebacker, but he stands the linebacker up just right in the gap. Jamin Davis can't do anything. Like Saquon Barkley owned Jamin Davis in this game, bro. <laughs> Saquon, Saquon beat him on, on multiple plays. It was really fun to watch. That's just a beautiful play overall by Tyrod Taylor in this offense. So we also saw a somewhat diversified rushing approach from the New York Giants. Nothing too crazy, but I charted some of their runs. It was mostly split zone, but we also saw GH counter a handful of times, and this is going to be one of those plays. Saw a duo run, saw a couple inside zone, a halfback stretch, saw a dart, tackle, wrap, whatever you want to play, so or whatever you want to call it. So we saw several different types of runs from this offense. And on this play, we're just going to see a GH counter. We see this a lot. Backside guard pulls along with the H-pack. And I just think this is such a, a great little detail by Saquon Barkley. Watch as the Washington commanders get penetration. Saquon Barkley just shimmy and sway away from this penetration and then find his block and redirect himself to pick up good yardage here. I don't know. I just, for whatever reason, I appreciated this run yeah. by Saquon Barkley because I don't know who that is. That might be Deron Payne, who's an absolute beast. He gets Saquon Barkley off his landmark. Saquon Barkley has to reorient himself. He avoids the contact and just lowers his shoulder and picks up a couple extra yards. And then you look at Darren Waller. Darren Waller coming across a formation. Watch him contact Jamin Davis perfectly. Outside shoulder on outside shoulder. Yep. Create the seal. Create the seal. Turn Jamin Davis, who is supposed to be filling this gap well, away from the play. And that's exactly what Darren Waller does. And Darren Waller has been used in this role. This is typically a role with Daniel Bellinger, but you don't want to put Daniel Bellinger out there all the time to, to run this route, not for from a physicality standpoint, just because you're going to be tipping your hand. It's going to be, oh, it's going to be right. GH counter. No, so you put Darren Waller out there. Now you can run GH counter. It might not be expected. And he's able to throw this block on Jamin Davis to open up. This is a pretty damn wide hole with Glowinski yeah. engaged, with 79 Phillips engaged, and then Jalen Hyatt taking on Cameron Curl. So just a really well-executed play by the New York Giants up front on this GH counter. And they did a couple things I liked on that play. First of all, it came after the explosive pass play to Hyatt. So it was up tempo and they ran it, which I thought gave them an advantage. And the other thing I wanted to point out was I really liked the threat from Tyree Phillips to go to, to, to attack the double team, help out a little bit there and then climb to that second level and get oh, to dude. that linebacker. Like that's a nice rep from 79 there. I'm so glad you brought that up because this is exactly what you're supposed to do. And the, the double team is on the one technique. So that's the player that the Giants are blocking down on. Because the end man on the line of scrimmage is, he's off of a five technique, not quite a wide nine, but he's wide of the tackle. And that's not Tyree Phillips' responsibility. That's going to be the backside guard's responsibility to kick him out. Tyree Phillips' responsibility is to double team up to the play side linebacker. So what do you do? You have to aggressively attack the outside hip to form the double team with your guard. And he does that. You see the pop on contact against Ridgeway, and then Phillips just goes square right to this linebacker and then eliminates him. That's a really well done play by Phillips. And I'm really glad that you brought that up, dude. Yeah. Excellent execution, honestly, from multiple players on the giants on this play. This is just how it's supposed to be done. And it's good to see the run game start to get, get a little bit more uh, on the same page. So originally the giants come out and they're in a bunch formation and they're going to motion Waller. All of the defense just takes a step towards the motion side. Cause now you have a double strength to that side. The running back is on the opposite side of the uh, of that, or he's on the same side of that double strength, but the opposite side of typically where you would run the football to in a shotgun formation. So look at the leverage that Wondell Robinson has at the bottom of the screen against this linebacker who is on the hash. You just run 
the number one Jalen Hyatt right at the cornerback and you just run out. There's just, this is an easy pitching catch. I'm not certain why uh, this wasn't accounted for and why Washington seemed to be more focused on something else at this time. Cause you have a too high look. It's going to be a quarters coverage off leverage. No one can account for Wandale Robinson. Tyrod quickly processes this hits his back foot, gets the football football, to Wandale Robinson. And then look, he just makes a bunch of linebackers miss in space. Two of them run into each other and he picks up 22 yards. Just absolutely embarrassing this defense. Yeah. And this is one of those plays, Nick, that I watched and I thought one all game we've been seeing, and this is not prior to this play, but as you watch through the tape, all game we've been seeing the Giants do a good job of using pre-snap motion to you to basically serve as eye candy, Darren Waller in this regard. That was something we've always discussed last year, a really good job by Kafka. But two, this was a good example of something that I think Brian Dable mentioned in the post-game press conference, was, which was that he felt like the timing of the passing game was in a mm-hmm. really good spot. This was really well-timed in the passing game. Like you said, Tyrod Taylor hits his back foot. His whole lower body is connected. The ball's out. It's right to the outside shoulder, which allows Wondell Robinson to make that pivot and cut back inside and freezes up that defensive back, or sorry, that linebacker. Yes, it's not the the guy Washington wants on Wendell Robinson there. But if that timing is off or if the ball placement is off, it's just not going to be a yard after the catch type of play. And the Giants get an extra 10, 15 yards because the timing is so strong on this play. And it's also, you got to credit the coaching for attacking the the defensive decision-making. Like Jack Del Rio, you want to come out and base against our right. 12? That's how threatened you are by Saquon Barkley in our rushing attack? Cool, watch this. We're going to hit Wandell Robinson out of this stack, which was a bunch, and your linebacker is not going to be able to account for him. Like that, That's just, you know, you, you have to have a better plan than that because Wandell catches this football, and he knows, oh, dude, that's a linebacker out there? I'm going to make this guy look silly, and he does exactly that. Yep, just an awesome play. One of the Giants' explosive pass plays from this game. We're going to get, an, get another explosive play on the very next play. First and 10. This is Darius Slayton's explosive play. Look who's on the field. Paris Campbell is the motioning player. We saw a lot of motion uh, with the Buffalo Bills as well. Just kept Buffalo mm. honest, opened up some running lanes whenever the Giants decided to hand the football off. Well, here we're going to have Paris Campbell come. This is uh, come across the formation and uh, Tyrod Taylor is going to hit his back foot zone coverage, something that the Giants just carved through this entire game going to have Darius Slayton run over the middle of the field and he just works his way away from the the uh, safety that's stepping down to account for Paris Campbell. You see how he works away yep. from him and then he works over the top of the linebacker and there's the throwing window. So he gets himself basically into the, I mean, it really is the first throwing window, but it kind of is the second as well since yeah. Darius Slayton goes and crosses the face of that safety, but Tyrod's more than likely not going to throw the football there. It would not be smart. So he forces his linebacker to open his hips, works right around him. Tyrod delivers this football before Darius Slayton clears the linebacker. Look, this football is coming out right now. Darius Slayton's not clearing the linebacker yet. So what does that do? That gives Darius Slayton the opportunity to catch this football before this linebacker on the bottom of the screen, on the bottom hash, can work over there. And this is one of the other reasons why Brian Dable was praising the timing and yes. the rhythm of this offense because that pass really allowed Darius Slayton to create this explosive play with yards after the catch because it was so well-timed and thrown in an anticipatory manner. You broke that down so well, Nick, and I think... As you explained, this is another example of great timing in the past game. And if that timing is not perfect like it was and that ball placement isn't there, that second linebacker is the guy who's going to make the play on that. And that's what turns that into an eight-yard gain or maybe even a hit that jars the ball loose for a fumble or an incomplete pass rather than a huge explosive play after the catch that was able to be had there by uh, Darius Slayton. You can see right here, Tyrod is already rearing back to throw this football. Ball is out. 51 is turning his back right on the numbers Oof. for Darius Slayton. Catch the football, Perfect. run, outrun a couple defenders, pick up extra yards, create your second consecutive explosive play, something that the Giants did not get much of. And we got to see some Paris Campbell there, but let's go on to this third and 15 touchdown pass to Darren Waller. This is my favorite throw of the game. This is a great concept. First cover two, you're going to see you get like a smash seam type of concept because it's a three by one set. You're going to have a seam from Darren Waller. And at the bottom of the screen, you kind of have a smash concept. It's not typically the hitch, but one guy goes in. You're going to have the flag going out with, with uh, Wandale Robinson running that flag. And it's a cover two defense. So this is a good call. But Darren Waller, as he explodes up here, the, the linebacker is going to take the inside leverage on him and try to force him to the safety. Then you have the other middle hook defender who is underneath Darren Waller. This ball has to be placed optimally for this to 
be a touchdown. It takes a lot of balls, bro, and a lot of confidence okay. to throw this football. Now, Wondell Robinson kind of held that safety in place. You can see the safety open his hips slightly to the outside to create more space for Darren Waller. But all this is being confirmed by Tyrod Taylor. Like, as Darren Waller is running this route, you could see he's turning to the inside. But you can't throw the football to the inside with the linebacker that close to you. So you have to put it to the back shoulder and also put enough touch on it to avoid this middle hook defender who was just outside of the hash. Tyrod Taylor does just that. By the time the football gets to him, Darren Waller's in the end zone. And look how many players are around him. You'll really see it on the end zone copy. This is a very well-placed ball. I want to get your opinions on these dance moves. I know you're a huge <laughs> dance aficionado. But look at the ball placement here. That's elite. Sick. There are three defenders around Darren Waller. He puts it high and away from each of those defenders, allowing his playmaker to make a play. And you just got to applaud this, man. This is such an underrated throw and such a well-adjusted play by Darren Waller to come down with this football and ensure that no one knocks it out. And then he, I don't really know what kind of dance moves these are. I don't even know if these are good dance moves, but you know what? Do you, man? Yeah, maybe the gritty. I don't know too much about dance moves either, Nick, but back to the play. It just... Look, how many times have we seen the Giants or any team get themselves in a third and goal from the 15 and then convert that to a touchdown? It doesn't happen. It hasn't happened. Find me your my examples if you've got them. But this is just not something we've seen a lot from the Giants or any offense, really. I don't study every offense, Nick, so I don't know. But it's hard to dig out of third and goal from the 15. What it requires is pinpoint perfect ball placement like there is here and Excellent timing. This goes back to what we were saying before about what Brian Dable praised after the game about the timing of the pass game. The timing has to be there too, because that ball has to hit the back shoulder. Yeah. The placement has to be as amazing as you broke down, but if that ball doesn't hit that back shoulder placement as it does there, the safety breaks on it and it's incomplete or the linebacker breaks on it and it's incomplete. Either way, it's not a completed pass and it could be worse. It could be an injury. It could be a fumble or not a fumble. It could be an interception, tipped interception. Like it reminds me of to a not the same type of play, but that Eli to Manningham throw in the Super Bowl, where if that ball is an inch left, it's out of bounds. That ball is an inch right. The cover two safety breaks on it. That ball is an inch ahead of him. It's incomplete or an inch under throw and the corner breaks on it. It's a similar type of window type idea. And obviously a much tougher throw was Eli to Manningham. But the idea yeah. is similar. You have no window. You have to be perfect on your timing and you have to be perfect on your ball placement. All of those things were available there and apparent there in that throw by Tyrod Taylor. No window. What is this? A strip club? Ba -bum -bum. All right. Now, nah, but uh, this is a, this is a really well time throw. And you also have to applaud the pocket. This is a great pocket yes. by the Giants. Washington decided to drop seven into coverage. They only sent four. Look, if you're going to get pressure on the New York Giants, you probably want to slant. You probably want to twist. Mm -hmm. You probably want to do a lot of um, creative, creative things to manipulate the protection and just get one block or two blockers on one here. They just all kind of traditionally try to win outside and you can win like that against the giants, especially when Evan Neal's out there, but with the six man protection, you have Matt Breida to protect Justin Pugh. And it's just like, look at that pocket. That is an elite pocket yeah. that Tyrod Taylor gets to throw from easily. That's definitely worth bringing up. And I'm glad you said that. And now we're going to talk about a pocket that wasn't necessarily elite, but this is the touchdown play to Saquon Barkley. I absolutely love this, this play from Tyrod Taylor and from Saquon Barkley. Look, the Giants clear out one side of the field. You're going to see the deep over route because the, the, uh, the nub tight end, the Y tight end is Darren Waller, and you're going to have three eligible receivers on the other side. This is 12 personnel. I believe this is base personnel too. I, I could be mistaken. They might've matched to nickel at this point because the Giants were carving them up with uh, 12, pa 12 personnel passing. But watch Darren Waller just clear out the bottom of the screen. You're going to see the pattern match of Washington. There's going to be a push call. He's pushing Darren Waller, but he also is sinking because he sees the backside crossing route. So this is a play that we would applaud uh, Deontay Banks for. So you can see him sinking underneath the backside crossing route. So now they have a high-low on the backside crossing route. But what does that do? That creates an isolation, a one-on-one -on -one matchup for Saquon Barkley against a linebacker. What did we talk about a lot last week, Dan? We talked a lot about how the Giants were so obviously trying to get Saquon Barkley isolated against Dorian Williams, but it just did not work. So on this play, Tyrod Taylor does traditional play action from under center, something we didn't see a ton of in this game. And Saquon right. Barkley just out-athletes Jamin Davis. But also... Tyrod Taylor's path on this play was another reason why I think Jimin Davis was slightly hesitant to come down because you're going to have the play action element. 
Tyrod Taylor in the pocket's still actually pretty good here, but Tyrod Taylor steps up because he sees it's man coverage. He sees everyone is cleared out, steps up. And now you can see Jamin Davis is looking right at two. He's looking right at Tyrod Taylor. He's like, are you going to run? You're going to run. Right. And then he's like, oh crap, man. What about 26? And now he's a absolute angle eraser. And Saquon Barkley does what Saquon Barkley does. and takes this all the way to the house. Absolutely love this play, getting more explosive plays through the passing attack. This one, a little bit more unconventional from a play action standpoint. It's so unconventional, Nick, because we're rewinded a bit. It's like the conventional side of it is why is Tyrod Taylor stepping up into this pocket? He doesn't really need to. It's such a good pocket. But the unconventional side of it is if he doesn't step in, up into this pocket, does this play ever happen? Does Jamin Davis ever have that hesitation for the quick second as Taylor moves forward? And does he stay with Barkley otherwise or stay enough with Barkley to make the tackle after the catch? Right. Like, so that's the funny part about fun part about this play. It's like Tyrod probably shouldn't be a stepping up into this pocket. While at the same time, if he never does, I'm not sure if Jamin Davis actually you know, hesitates and steps forward real quick against Barkley. And then Barkley has the ability to create that much separation. He's going to create some separation, but that much. And then the third part about this play, as you see more from the end zone angle is look, this is not as easy a throw as people think it might be as you're stepping up, moving forward from an unbalanced base from that arm slot and arm angle. It is not that easy to get that ball outside as he does here to Saquon Barkley. And it's so important to get the ball outside the Barkley because that allows Barkley to lose no momentum as he turns up field there. You can watch Barkley catches that and doesn't lose the momentum. It still almost gets tackled. If that ball placement is not where that is, or it slows him down in any possible way, it's going to be a six-yard gain. It's not going to be a touchdown here. So that is a really good job by Tyrod and the quarterback here of changing his arm slot, getting the ball to a position that doesn't require the receiver or the running back in this case to slow down after making the catch, allows him to lose no momentum and transition upfield. And, you know, not not to bring this back to Jones, but there have been times where Jones has missed on some of these throws in the flat or has made them, but they've slowed down the post catch. And so I just think it's worth discussing here. This play was definitely unconventional. It's a play that, you know, we might say earlier, like, don't escape this pocket. But I'm not so sure if he doesn't escape this pocket and move forward into it if this play ever happens. Well, look, dude. Let's watch the stripe of Tyrod's helmet. We know what's happening here. You have Darren Waller running a deep over and then another over from the backside. Tyrod goes into the, the, the mesh point, if you want to call it that, and then he's still in his drop back, and he's watching all of these routes develop, and he's seeing what's happening. You could see how the stripe of his helmet is moving from right to left. So he is watching that backside crossing route. So at this time, right before he hits his back foot, he sees how that cornerback who was originally assigned to Darren Waller's making a push call while sinking to depth to undercut the backside crossing route. So what does that confirm to Tyrod all in a manner of a split second? It confirms that, hell, there is no one right. other than Jamin Davis on this side of the field, on this side of the hash within myself and 20 yards. So I'm going to hit my back foot and I'm going to isolate Jamin Davis in a situation wow, where he's going to have to right. make a decision. Do you want to take Saquon Barkley or do you want to take me? And this is something Daniel Jones did fantastically last year as well. Right. And now he goes, okay, you're going to look at me because you can see if you're watching on YouTube, Jamin Davis looking at Tyrod a little bit long, his feet, he's still square to Tyrod Taylor yeah. as Saquon Barkley has entered his break. He's still square to Tyrod Taylor. So Tyrod's like, all right, fine. I'm just going to dump it off to Saquon. Saquon's a better athlete than you are. And he is. And Saquon takes it to the house. So that also kind of plays into processing as well. It's just a really, um, yeah. A lot Great of collecting a lot of information, man, right there, collecting a lot of information and then capitalizing on it. I really like that point by you there, Nick, about how the information he collected there was that there was going to be so much space on that side of the field. We always talk about it's a numbers game for a quarterback, like figure out where your space is going to be on the field. He collected that information and knew there is all look how much space there is even after that catch, right? Like Tyrod steps all the way through the pocket, which should obviously, you know, and I'm sure it does. We can't see it from the back end signal to the rest of the Redskins defense that or the commanders events that we have to start moving back right. And even after all of that and Barkley catches outflanks the linebacker, there's still just so much space on the field. Like they can't get back in time because so many uh, defenders have vacated to the right side of the field already. And they also, you can give credit maybe to the coaching staff too. I'm not certain, but sure. Jack Del Rio does this a lot when he's in quarters coverage right? He'll pass off the one route. It's an inside breaking route. The cornerback will pass off and he's going to flash his eyes to the backside to see if there's a crossing route that he can work to undercut because of the safety. You can see Cam Curl, number 31, also was closing down on Darren Waller. They're paying attention to Darren Waller. Someone needs to undercut 
the backside crossing route because it's going to have over the top help. But as we know, it's not going to prevent you from catching a long pass. It's just going to prevent a touchdown more than likely. So it's going to clear out so much space. So the Giants end up taking advantage of that space. I, I absolutely love this uh, play overall from the Giants, man. It's great to break down good New York Giants offensive film. Yeah. Man. It really it's refreshing. It's a lot more fun. All right, we're going to get to a third and two. This is going to be the Tyrod miss to Wandale Robinson. So I brought up a little bit earlier how one of the adjustments that Washington made, and it did somewhat slow down the New York Giants offense, mm. but I also think it was a product of the Giants playing way too conservatively because they knew Washington couldn't do anything offensively against that defense. So they went really conservative in the second half. But Washington also started running a lot more cover one, a lot more man coverage. The Giants incorporate a really good man beater here. And Tyrod just flat out misses it. You can see the man coverage beater. The number one wide receiver is going to run towards the outside shoulder of the defender who is on Wandale Robinson. Doesn't necessarily have to contact him, but it's a rub route. It's a pick route. And they understand that you can get away with this if it's not blatant and you just like show your hands and act as if you're an eligible receiver. So what's Wandell Robinson going to do? He's just going to run underneath the release of the number one receiver wide open. Tyrod Taylor sailed it. And that's just going to happen sometimes. Wandell Robinson also has a catch radius too of like Danny Wood. On this. this was the worst throw of the game by Tyrod Taylor. His, I don't know if there were too many others, but his only missed throw. He might have had some, you know, he had a misread we went over earlier on second and 11, and he might have had some others in there. But this was the only actual missed throw. He just, I think he just gets a little too excited and puts just too much heat on this because you can see it just hit hard off of Wandell's hands. And obviously, as you mentioned before the pod, Nick, like Wandell doesn't have the biggest catch radius. So it's like not the right receiver you want to come in hot throw in there. Again, this will be the only time you'll hear me say, I think Paris Campbell should be in for that play over Wandell Robinson, just because okay. Paris, yeah. Paris Campbell. And I, I don't really actually mean that because I think Wandell can do so much when you get the football to him in these situations. But Wandell Robinson has one of the smallest wingspans mm -hmm. ever in the NFL. It's something that mm -hmm. when the Giants drafted him, we're like, this guy is an outlier by like three different metrics, like hand size, the wingspan, arm line, all that stuff. And he's small. He's like 5'8 or whatever the hell he is. So... Um, but yeah, this, this ball still needs to be placed on them and, uh, it's just not, and this was a third and two situation. So it's still kind of a critical down. Yep. For sure. Big, big miss from Taylor here. All right, Dan. And now we have this second and nine, 929 left in the fourth quarter. There wasn't as much fireworks in the mm -hmm. second half of this game, but one last fireworks, the grand finale, as they call it another deep pass for 40 plus yards to Jalen Hyatt, oh, man, dude, you can really see the stutter here. Watch, I'm going to sink my hips. No, I'm not. And Benjamin St. Juice just gets caught up. Dude, there's real NFL elite speed yeah. from this wide receiver. And Tyrod Taylor throws a good football here. You can see him looking off the safety. They're going to have the post safety flowing to the middle of the field. Tyrod Taylor catches it, head towards the post safety, hit the back foot. He really waits. He's really patient with, th with this one because he knows that safety's looking to fly over if he indicates that he's throwing to Jalen Hyatt. And this ball is placed in a manner where that safety had no chance on this football regardless. This is an elite yeah. throw from Tyrod Taylor right along the sideline and allowed Jalen Hyatt to drag both those feet. And remember, this got reviewed and upheld. It was a very close call, but Jalen Hyatt, big boy stuff, keeping his feet in bounds. Yeah, dragged that toe, which was awesome to see. Great breakdown from you. What I love most about this play, Nick, it was second and nine. We're not looking to the sticks. We're confirming pre-snap and post-snap that he's going to have a one-on-one. -on -one. There's off coverage, which should work to, to juice his, uh, not to juice. What's, uh, what's St. Juice's Benj favor? Benjamin, yeah. but Benjamin St. Juice's favor, but it doesn't because like you said, Jalen Hyde has such good speed and second gear that he can chew up off coverage there and just get that separation there. Uh, just we an just, awesome just, play all around eats into the cushion, man. Like this guy's a cushion eater. Like you can give him the cushion. Sure. But if he hits you with a double move and then you fall right. for the bait, which this is a play the giants ran a lot last year. This is just, all right, it's middle of the field closed pre-snap. That's what it's going to be post-snap. We believe. So we're going to run, just stutter and go. One of these wide receivers need to win, hold the safety in the middle of the field and bet the matchup that you like best. And that's going to be Jalen Hyatt against St. Juice. And you can see how that stutter at the sticks. Like, look, oh, I'm going to the sticks. Oh, no, I'm not. Yep. Just ran right around him. Oof. That looked look, awesome right there. Yeah, man. And that ball just kind of fades right to the sideline perfectly so Jalen Hyatt can run underneath it. Look, Tyrod Taylor doesn't have Patrick Mahomes' arm, but that's still a really damn good throw. Yeah, it's a big distance throw from him, and he doesn't have a great arm. And also, it was, according to people who were at the game, an incredibly windy game. 
a lot of wind was a fat, big factor in this game, which surprised me that a lot of these deep balls were so on target based on the wind, um, which just goes to show, uh, you know, good game here from Tyrod Taylor. Definitely one of his best games, I thought, you know, that we've seen from him for sure. I mean, when's the last time Tyrod Taylor has started a football game? It would have been the Chargers, right? Justin Herbert's right. rookie season. No, and Houston, before- I think. Houston. Oh, Houston. Yes, you're right. Houston, he did. Yeah, he started a couple games, and then it was the Chargers, and then before that, it was Baker Mayfield with the Brownlee. This guy's been everywhere, dude. He's had a long career with some weird shit that's happened to him, so I'm glad he's having this moment here. He comes in and throws for 270 with two TDs, five receptions of 20-plus yards of different receivers, and two touchdowns. You know, that's a pretty damn efficient game from him. So good stuff all around. I'm going to show a couple plays here that I wanted to discuss. This first one is a good example of what we were discussing earlier. So I wanted to bring it up, Nick, which is how fast Tyrod processes information before even getting to the back of his drop. And then how fast it allows him to work through his reads. Just focus. If you're watching this on YouTube, focus on Tyrod's helmet, which is focusing on his eyes. Look at after he snaps the football, how fast he works through all of his progressions here. He'll get the ball. He'll look play side. It's not there. And then he looks to the middle of the field. It's not there either. Then he looks backside. It's not there. He goes back here, flashes back to the play side, just in case something opened up instead of hanging on the play side and staying there and staring there for a second, second and a half, two seconds, he goes back. It's not there. So what does he do after going through all four of those options? He decides, let me run it for the first down. This was third and two. He picks up three yards for the conversion. I just loved how fast he moved through his progressions there, Nick. Danny, I don't know what's funny, and that was really well broken down, but I remember Saquon Barkley had a quote about Tyrod Taylor saying that, I don't know why, but he always smells good. And I feel like that is well represented in the way he plays. He he looks like somebody who smells good. Does that make any sense whatsoever? He's very smooth. Not a layman like me. It doesn't make sense. I don't know if I'm hip enough for that, Nick. I would, I'm not uh, hip know. at all, though. You might be. You might be. Oh, look, we're, we're already passing another play, but... He's cool as the, as the, as the, what is he? He's cool as the opposite side of the pillow. Is that no? The other yeah, side. Yeah. Yeah. Cool as the opposite yeah. side of that's a, that's a quote from Stuart Scott. Scott. That's yeah, a Stuart Scott like, quote. I feel like I messed it up somehow. And here oh, we're going to do another play here. Um, This one was one of my favorite plays of the game that didn't get talked about yet by us. Nick, you put up the clip on Twitter. I put up the clip on Twitter. You just put up one line on it, just graceful. And I think that's a, that's a fine line. If we had to pick one word or so what not line one word to describe this play, I would describe it as that, but there's more you could say about this play. Um, this was another conversion by Tyrod Taylor, I believe on a third and two, but I'm not positive about that. So we'll look at the player. No, this was a first and 10 here. He catches the snap. The pressure is coming from chase young immediately instead of escaping right here which I've seen quarterbacks do, even though it is, you know, a nice job by Saquon Barkley to help pick up. Oh, yeah. He steps up into the pocket. There's nothing there because the linebacker's coming up. So he transitions smoothly to the left. Now, as he's rolling, look at this ability to make that throw. That is arm slot. That is changing your arm slot here. As he's rolling to his opposite shoulder, he's able to flip his hips and look at that arm slot he throws from. I just love different arm slot throws. That is such a pretty looking throw right there from Tyrod Taylor. You do not a lot of quarterbacks are able to do this, this kind of three fourth sidearm throw. Uh, throw while moving to your left and then keep the accuracy and the ball placement good. Sometimes if you try a throw like this while rolling, sprinting to your left, it's going to go way all over the place. The ball placement is going to be terrible. He's able to full sprint to his left and then still keep that throw on target. It's beautiful. It's graceful. It really is. But I'll say this too. If you were playing Madden, Dan, yeah. Tyron Taylor is not completing that pass. Like you throw no way out of way. bounds. Yeah, you know That's what, I mean? what I'm saying, dude. You're getting an errant throw there, maybe even an interception if you're playing Madden. And this is one final play I want to talk to, just to speak a little bit more to that first point I was making, which is um, just looking how fast he moves through his progressions and how much information, as Nick said, he collects before even getting the snap. Here he looks play side and immediately comes off it because. You can see right away, you can't see from this angle, but the play side is not there. This is designed to go here. This is a spacing concept, quick game. The Giants run a lot of quick game. I know a lot of people have been like, no, we, or not a lot of people. One foolish person on Twitter said, no, he's just looking right to you know, freeze the linebacker so he can come back to a swing press on the left. It couldn't be further from the truth. He's looking right because this is a spacing concept designed to go here to the right. He's so fast to process that it, is, it isn't there post-snap that he comes off of it immediately. Can't go to Wandell because he's already off it by this point. Here's what, this is the point where he, so as he comes off so fast, watch, comes off here. Now he pause. He's trying to, Wandell, 
bracketed right here. Can't go Wandell. Some people have said you can lead Wandell into space, maybe, but that passing lane is tight, and 52 can probably get in it. And he's already off it by this point. You can see it by the stripe of his helmet. He's already come off of it, as he should. So then he finally comes back to the swing here to Barkley, gives him a chance to make somebody miss in space. Barkley's not able to. At this point, it's played well by Washington. But this is just a good example of how fast he processes information because he doesn't spend much time on the play side there. A lot of people are going to spend time looking for this quick game to get open on the spacing concert. And it's just not open, and it's a good job by him to come off of it fast. And he gave the football to Saquon Barkley, and Saquon Barkley was accounted for, but there was about six, five or six yards of space between Saquon Barkley and the defender who was coming down from depth to meet him. Right. Saquon ends up picking up, I think, like six yards on this play because he catches the football, and then he lowers his shoulder and runs through 23. 23 brings him down, but it's still a, a, a solid pickup. It keeps the right. Giants on schedule, and that's all we're looking for right now. And it's not a tipped ass up that could be intercepted. If you throw this to the side, it might have been because Washington was ready for it. I also want to run the play one more time and just have people look simply at Tyrod's lower half and his footwork. Everything is just so connected. I brought this up earlier, but you can just watch it here. Watch his feet. Watch how connected that looks as he gets back across to that to that there uh, to the swing pass. It's just like tap once, tap twice, bang, get over there. And it just, it helps him stay on target. It helps keep his ball placement on point for the majority of the throws, pretty much everything but that Wandell throw this game. No, absolutely, man. I'm right there with you. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the Giants offensive line. And then we're going to, some notes and takeaways from the offensive line. Then we're going to get to superlatives and then we're going to get out of here. So where do you want to start with the offensive line in this game from what you saw? I just want to say, because I've seen people talking about this on Twitter, and they're absolutely right. The communication of the offensive line was so much better. You discussed how they picked up that one twist. I don't really think Washington yeah. twisted as much as they probably should have. They hardly blitzed. They, they did not bring that much pressure against New York, which was also somewhat surprising, even though they're not yeah. really a they're not really a blitz heavy team. They more so rely on their their pass rush, which it, which is a good pass rush. But altogether, you could still see it's a much more functional competent and communicative offensive line. And Brian Dable talked about it after uh, the game. He said, we're going to move Marcus McKethan or McKeithen over to left guard to play next to Justin Pugh because he's a veteran. And that's going to allow Mark Lewinsky to play next to Tyree Phillips, who's been here for a cup of espresso or whatever the hell, even though he was here prior. So mm -hmm. you can have a veteran there to basically assist Phillips. And I think that really helped, at least against this team. I don't know if it would have helped against a lot of the other teams the Giants saw earlier, but right now I have more confidence in this offensive line heading into week eight. And luckily for the Giants, well, not, it's not a lot of confidence, but luckily for the Giants, it appears like right now they're getting Andrew Thomas and John Michael Schmitz back, which maybe. is going to allow them, maybe, which is going to allow them to really put Justin Pugh wherever they want to put him. He should still be a star. Tyree Phillips, wherever they want him. Hopefully Evan Neal's back. So at least it's trending in the right direction. Because for the first six weeks, really, first five mm -hmm. weeks, really, it was shit. So I just yeah. wanted to say that I, I'm just happy that at least it's not a focal point of being an absolute disaster and tire fire like it's been all year. Yeah, and look, things could look different fast against Jets. The Jets are good. I have no clue how the Giants are going to block Quinn and Williams. I just don't yeah. know because there's just no way to do it. You saw, and we'll see on the next pod, how bad Nick Gage struggled with Dexter Lawrence in this game. It was a disaster for the Washington watching Dexter Lawrence against Gates. And so that could be issues. And this wasn't a perfect game from the offensive line. I thought Pew at times struggled on the edge, and so did Tyree Phillips. And that's to be expected. The pat, Like you said, Washington has good pass rushers on the edge. They really do. And they have a good defensive front. It wasn't the easiest matchup in the world. But just to see that improvement in communication, Nick, to see that all those clean pockets we just broke down for Tyrod Taylor, which we didn't see a lot of with Jones against Miami. We didn't see a lot with Jones against Seattle even, right? So they were just felt like a difference, a competency with this O-line. But we did benefit from, like you said, and I think it's an astute point, like Washington didn't run as many games up front, and that's just not a good plan if you're an opposing D.C. Maybe it's not something you do as a defense, but sometimes you got to make games plan specific, uh, game plan specific game plans and that was one that i think they definitely missed on in this game but anything else on the old line before we get to superlatives now let's run right into the superlatives okay superlatives give me your unheralded player of the game ben bredesen was the unheralded player look ben bredesen he's an adequate starter replaceable starter but he's a functional player to use that word again and I felt like he played well against Deron Payne and Jonathan Allen, two of the better interior defensive linemen in the league. I've watched Deron Payne absolutely trash the giant centers of the past. That includes Nick Gates. That includes John Jalapio and players like that. And I felt like Ben Bredesen held his own against those two. 
Yeah, this was a good call by you. I I was between two players. Bredesen was in the mix. He was not the guy I went with. He was the runner up. And the reason being that he was in the mix is because look, this is only what his third game starting at center Nick ever in his whole life. Like to be this competent in a game like that, it was pretty impressive because he's looked at times incompetent at center before this. So he definitely had the best game of his career at center. I should say, obviously he had some good snaps at guard last year, but I gave it to Mark Lewinsky because you know, he's under the radar, but this dude is having a bit of a revival in his career. I don't know what happened there between the time he was benched to now, but if he's going to play like he did on tape these past two games, Nick, like he belongs in that lineup when everyone's healthy. Andrew Thomas can be left tackle. That's fine. That's obvious. Right tackle will discuss. I still think it should be Evan Neal, but right guard should be Glowinski, and you work from there. Justin Pugh, yes, he should be in the lineup. Put him at left guard. There you go. Maybe that means Bredesen doesn't play. That's okay for me. Over and yet some people say, oh, shouldn't they play Bredesen at right guard? I'm not so sure. If Glowinski puts the tape that he put together this game and last game, he belongs starting in this lineup over Bredesen, over you know any of these players that you can mention, Tyree Phillips, whoever you want to throw in there. Mark Glowinski looked really good on tape for him, but still, yeah. it, it was... I was impressed with what I saw. And that includes even in pass protection. He looked I know. so much more sticky. One thing about the pass protection, maybe I should have mentioned, I felt like the Giants were really aggressive with their punch. I saw a lot of two-hand punches, which isn't always the best thing, but just a lot of attempting to dictate to Washington. Like once I see that chest, I am attacking. Like yeah. I'm not going to be passive. And I don't think I saw that as much in previous weeks. It's just a slight difference that I'm that I'm noticing, but it just I, like that. I think it also just comes with confidence though, and they're playing a much more confident brand of football. Well, there you go. Let's get to the next superlative here. The best route you saw run uh on the film. Look, uh I don't really have one that stood out over others. I think Jalen Hyatt just winning up the sideline is one that I'll probably throw out there, but there wasn't one route that I was like, oh wow, this one is so much better than than another one. Maybe Darren Waller's just adjustment. If you want to throw that into the route, that On I could probably go with that sure. one. Yeah. I'm okay with that one. I'm okay with the deep over that Waller ran after the interception from Banks. I thought that was just really well spaced by him and he maximized like where to throw, you know, gave a great target spot for Tyra Taylor. I also would probably put, if it came down to me, the play we broke down earlier though, the second and nine shot to Jalen Hyatt, the second long play to Hyatt, because just that ability to sink his hips and then explode back up and lose no momentum. It's, it's special level yeah. traits and it's, I'll put, it may not be the, you know, we keep going. Oh, it's something he can run over and over on tape, but it's still a great route to watch someone be able to do that and create that kind of separation against off leverage. Like that's the craziest part. Like it wasn't even like St. Juice was pressed up. He was an off leverage and he still chewed that up. Like you said so well. So I'll give it to Jalen Hyatt there. What was the best throw you saw on tape? Would have been the Darren Waller touchdown, but I'm going to change yeah. it up a little bit and say okay. the Jalen Hyatt 1.0 pass just slightly ahead of him. That was a very good yep. throw by Tyrod, but I don't want to have the same answer as you. So we're going to go with best throw, uh, Darren Waller. Yeah, I got to go with the touchdown to Waller. I mean, we discussed it earlier, just pinpoint perfect ball placement and timing there from the quarterback there. Best player on tape overall, in your opinion? Best player on tape. Could it easily went to Tyrod Taylor, had a phenomenal game, but I'm going to give this to Darren Waller. Darren Waller had seven catches on eight targets, 98 yards, and a touchdown. Touchdown was beautiful, well-adjusted to. He had a several just chain-moving plays that were hugely impactful in this game, and he was finally the player, and I think we saw glimpses of this through the season, but he was finally the player the Giants brought in, and we were like, this is the guy that we're adding, right? And he didn't even crack 100 yards, but that's a Darren Waller we need, and I know he still has that. He's not old. He's not washed. I'm right. going to go with Darren Waller. Yeah, Darren Waller has just really started to come into his own over these last two games, and that it was two players for me. It was Waller or Taylor, but I'm giving it to Taylor. I think Taylor's job is more difficult, and I think with the exception of the Wandell Robinson throw we showed, which missed, but still hit his hands, but missed, but it still hit his hands. It was just too hot. He needed to take off a little off that. Taylor was phenomenal in this game. The plays we yeah. broke down, his pocket manipulation, the deep balls that were just seemingly all on target with the exception of the early one to high it. Um, and I'm not talking about the end zone one. I'm talking about the one on like second and nine on the first possession. The end zone one was fine ball placement. I mean, it's possible that he can make a play on that at, at another time. It's inside a little, but it's pretty much fine there. So just have that kind of ball placement, the pocket manipulation, working through his reads, making all those plays. And I know he didn't have a great second half according to the numbers, but if you look at it, they didn't have that many possessions in the second half, the giants offense, we just broke it down on tape. Like, you know, they had the fumble with Barkley inside the nine. They had a punt return that tech that, you know, put the, 
put that put the offense that put the D Giants defense to say right back on the field that wasted a lot of time as well. There just wasn't that many possessions from the Giants offense on the second half. So it's partially why they didn't score a lot. So Taylor gets it for me. His job was a little bit more difficult than Darren Waller's. Give me a pass blocking grade one through 10. I have seven, two of the sacks. Like I said, were well, I guess the McKeith and one you have to blame on him just was bad peel back. But the other one was just a blown RPO. That was an eaten sack. Yeah. By Tyrod Taylor. Seven might be a little bit generous, but you know what, man? Justin Pugh starting at left tackle, Tyree Phillips starting <laughs> at right tackle. The, the state of the offensive line, let's roll with a seven. Yeah, adjusted down to it, I can see that. I gave it 5.9. I still feel like the play you mentioned with McCaffrey and also a couple of the the, the pass blocks by um, Pugh and the play they missed with Hyatt late in the game because, um, what's his name, Tyree Phillips missed the block outside. There's just still a few individually bad blocks in this game, and a lot of it was aided by quick game, I think, and just getting the ball out fast. But 5.9 is still fine. It's better than we've had. What about run blocking for you? Run blocking was a 5.8. Okay. I went 5.1. It was okay at times. I feel like their best play came when they ran tempo. There was the play we broke down, which was really nice and really well executed, right? Like, Tyree Phillips does an excellent job climbing on that play. You got Darren Waller ceiling. You have so many things working well in that play. But ultimately, I didn't feel like they had too many big plays sprung in the run game or too many plays that were successful that much. So it still needs to be close to average for me at 5.1. All right, that's all the time we have for today on the Offensive Film Breakdown. This is Big Blue Banter. Remember, you can support the show by joining us for our live streams and being a live chat, or I'm sorry, a super chat subscriber. That means get your question in and donate to the show. Or if you want to do it the free way, we really like that too. And that's all we always said that's all we'll ever ask. We're asking for a little bit more now, but not too much more. We're still only really asking for that though. Make sure by being a free helper, you are subscribing to the podcast. You're liking every show. You're liking uh, your leaving us a five-star review on on iTunes. If you haven't already, we're still below a thousand there. We've been teetering in the 900 number for a while there. I really want to see that hit one K. Um, I know I haven't asked for it as much, so maybe that's partially, if you haven't done it, please just leave us an iTunes review so we can get to one K there. Make sure you're signed up for auto download on the podcast. That's important as well. And other than that, that's all I ever ask. We'll be back this week with a lot of content. We have some interesting interviews coming up. We have a really, I'm something I'm really excited about to preview the Jets game. One of my favorite film analysts in, in, in basically the entire sphere who breaks down film for the Jets. He's the only film guy from what I've talked to with Jets fans. And he was excited about doing the show. I reached out to him. So I'm really excited about that. We have another interesting interview that we teased last week that might come this week. I think it still might. We have to, we have to figure that out. Nick and I, it's going to be unrelated to any matchup the Giants have, but it's going to be a big discussion on X's and O's and film from someone who played in the NFL and played the quarterback position. So I think it's a really good one to get him in for. So I'm going to tease that already, but it's happening at some point where we're going to make sure that works the schedule. Obviously we're going to have defensive film review after this and more content coming, maybe another mailbag because that went really well a couple of weeks ago. We'll see, but thanks again for tuning in. Have a great rest of your week and good night. <laughs>